I'm speaking today with Lance McDonald, who is the Associate Director for Philanthropy for the Nature Conservancy in South Carolina. Lance, what is the um, purpose of the Nature Conservancy? Well, the Nature Conservancy has a really long history. We were founded in 1951 in upstate New York and have really been come to be known as really the first land protection uh, nonprofit organization in the world. Um, we started protecting land back in the 1950s and started spreading out from New York. Our chapter in South Carolina is now 51 years old. Um, oh. we, we came here um, in 1969, so maybe we're almost 52 years old now. Um, but we started here really working um, on Bidler Forest and in the Ace Basin was really kind of the projects that we started with. And it really was steeped in that land protection, protect these special places, protect these high uh, biodiverse places and these habitats that are essential to our biodiversity and, and our state natural resources. So, Lance, um, in some of the places like the Bidla Forest, does that mean that y'all can purchase land or provide mm -hmm. funds? Um, and and what is and then there's another component to that that I think involves working with private landowners. So talk about those two things, please. Yeah. So um, so we do both. Um, land protection does have several different ways that that we can work to protect the land. Um, one is obviously acquiring it. Um, we are one of the largest landholders um, in the United States um, from a nonprofit agency in particular, um, but. It's not something that we want to do all the time. Um, we don't have huge staff that can manage these lands and, and hold them and, and you know provide trail systems and things of that nature. So a lot of times we'll partner with other state agencies, federal agencies, counties, and um, we'll go ahead and, and, and provide the funds to purchase the property. Um, we will sell it back to a public agency, perhaps for less than we bought it for, um, and put it into public hands so that they can provide the access to it for uh, public recreation, or they can protect it for other reasons. Um, we work with the DNR, uh, Department of Natural Resources. We work with state parks. We work with um, federal um, lands um, and a number of other places. And the other thing that we do is that we'll work with private landowners to put what are called private um, conservation easements on their properties. And basically what that does is it takes away certain rights um, of land use for that property. Um, so if it's a property, we might say that you can't subdivide it or that you can't build a certain number of buildings on it or that it can only be used for certain purposes like timber or um, agriculture. And so that, that, that way, the environmental portion of it stays intact in a mm -hmm. way that is a conservation value. And when that happens, if I'm not mistaken, there is a... Um an annual cost or, or that this isn't just something that's done for free because you have to then send people back in to make certain that the land is being used according to the agreement that you worked out. And there's not a specific agreement. I mean, this is a cooperative agreement between the landowners mm -hmm. and the Nature Conservancy. It's not something that you ram down their throat. You all come up and an, a, to an agreement. And if, and if you can't agree, you can't agree, but there is a good bit of room for, well, I'd like to do this and, you know, well, that's fine, but let's see if we can mitigate that by, would you be, do, be willing to do this? And then, um, so there, there, there's some, there's some of always cost involved because I have some friends who go in and do surveys um, for some of the conservation easements. So you, you know, we can't just put something in and then expect that it's always going to happen. Um, everybody's going to, remember everything. I mean, the original people could die and, and the new next generation not remember. So there is always the thing of going back and checking on how things have been con continued. Yes. Yes. So there is a, an annual monitoring that, that we are required to do um, per the, as the easement holder. Um, so we kind of, you know, when we purchase an easement or when an easement is um, donated to us, we then become the owners of that part of the property rights. And so okay. um, in order to maintain that, we do have to go in annually, monitor, make sure that the, that the, the easement is being um, a, 
applied to, um, that the property owners are not doing anything that the easement says they can't. Um, when ownership does change hands, um, of course, that is disclosed in any of those real estate transactions. And we do meet with the property owners um, after that transaction and just talk to them about what our process is, how we do it. Um, mm -hmm. We call the property owners before we go and monitor their properties. We take pictures. We send them the pictures. Sometimes we do drone overheads. Um, it, it really is kind of a an, an interesting um, part of our work. And this year in particular, we're actually working with the AmeriCorps system. And we have a couple of AmeriCorps oh. folks that um, we have that are coming in and doing about four months of our monitoring. Reaching out to another generation that already has mm -hmm. public services as part of their inherent value system, but you're expanding it. I think that's terrific. Good for y'all. You're always mm -hmm. looking for partners, as you said. Well, um, as a child who grew up in the days before people had generators, hurricanes have always been a part of our life. And I lived in the middle of the state and um, can remember days without electricity and trees falling. And, and we know now that um, the, the hurricane pattern has increased. Gosh, I mean, we, can't, we run out of names every year now. And this is, um, with climate change, the extreme weather conditions that we're facing are so um, frightening and seem to increase each year. And so let's talk a little bit about what y'all do on the coastline, because that's kind of our first line of defense down there. Yeah, well, since our early days of the Nature Conservancy of being really you know, based in land and protecting land, um, you know, we have moved into oceans and, um, and now we are really steeped in oceans. We're protecting ocean um, resources. We're trying to um, do some, you know, uh, water uh, quality things. We're working in reefs. We're working in fisheries. Here in South Carolina, you're right. You know, as, as South Carolinians, I think we can all feel the effects in one way or another um, from the change in our climate. Um, if you live in the upstate, you might have fires. Um, you live in the Midlands, where I am. You have floods, um, you know, like the 2015 flood that was so devastating. Uh -huh. And on the coast, you feel it almost on a daily basis. Um, you know, you're seeing the rising um, high tides. You're 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 watching the seas for the storms. Um, you, you're really kind of embracing this. You're also feeling it every time you pay your insurance. <laughs> um, yes. You know, monthly insurance costs. So. You know, we started working um, for nature-based climate solutions, um, which are uh, a variety of different tools that you can use. Um, I have a colleague that says you can engineer your way out of any problem, but you are going to continue to pay for it. But if you can put nature to work to be more resilient and to help you bounce back from natural climate changes, you're going to be well-versed to be able to withstand and rebound. We have sometimes thought that we could um, build seawalls and extra drainage systems and all in there, and although those are still in use and necessary mm -hmm. in places, um, I think now y'all are going right to the edge of the interface between the ocean and the hard land and concentrating on projects there with shorescaping in some cases. So let's describe that in some success cases and what you're seeing when you do that. Yeah, so we are, are working right there on the coastline, um, mostly in the marsh areas. Uh, the South Carolina actually has 20% of all of the salt marshes um, on the East Coast of the United States. And the Here salt marshes themselves are like nurseries for so much of what happens overall in the ocean in general, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they really are. I mean, you know, salt marshes are, are, are where the, the water, the fresh water comes in from our, uh, our rivers and our streams. The ocean is kind of coming in and it's where this very wonderful habitat exists that a lot of stuff is going on. But if the climate is not right there and you start having more salinity going up into our rivers or more fresh water coming into our oceans, that habitat can just get really unbalanced and be destroyed. And so it's, it's, it, it, we need to put nature back to work in a lot of those places. And, and what we have seen is eroding shorelines. Um, we're seeing the rising sea levels that are taking away the land that, um, that is you know, right there on the ocean. And so we have um, started working. We work around the United States in this. And so we borrow our science from our colleagues in Louisiana and in Virginia and all around. Um, but we have started putting to work um, living shorelines, which is 
we'll put different types of substance and materials based on the environment where we're going to be installing this living shoreline. And we've tested this. So we've done several um, pilot projects. We've done about 10 in the last 12 years working in partnership with state agencies to develop these pilot projects to see what different materials will work best in these different environments. Um, and so we use different things, oyster castles, which are um, fragments of oyster shells developed with maybe a little bit of like other types of materials that are clustered together. Um, we do bagged oyster shells. Um, we do some living materials, uh, plants that we kind of replant. And the effects that have happened um, are numerous. Um, so what they what these kind of living shorelines do is they will start to have regrowth of uh, seagrass behind uh -huh. these things that start restoring that coastline, start building back that, that land that has been eroded. They are also creating um, um, oysters. They're growing oysters on these uh, seawall or on these uh, living shorelines. They are um, cutting down on the intensity of the waves that are coming in or boat traffic when they're creating these wakes. Um, and they're creating a wonderful habitat for other fish. Um, so the fishermen that are in these salt marshes, they, you will see them all huddled around these little living shorelines because the other critters in the ocean are just attacking them um, and doing this. And we've been fortunate enough with making it grow to work with Kim Counts Morganello um, with school children um, where they've gone back and we used to call it Spor Spartana and now it's Sporobulus or something like that is the genus for the the, um, the grass that um, is the one that's the stabilizing one. So lots and lots of species um, where they went out and in one place planted these grasses. Um, and then we also went down where DNR was doing a program because we've all been told how important it is when we have an oyster roost to recycle the oyster shells because oysters in their larval form are free swimming and they have to have a solid substrate upon which to attach. And amazingly, the mother oyster shell, those clusters of oyster shells that we sometimes fuss at, lose, you know, when we find ourselves with our tennis shoes trying to maneuver our way over them, that's the perfect <laughs> substrate for that. And so that's one of the things that y'all put out as well. And we know that within Charleston, I think, and I was looking at some of the material that you sent me, um, I think about in about 2015, there may have been 20 high water days that weren't associated with some unusual event. And I think we're now, or have, I mean, they have them almost every week. Um, and one thing that does is that when that happens and you have all that influx of water, it overwhelms your sewer systems in many ways because the, the, there's such an influx of water that it, the sewer systems sometimes are overwhelmed. So that means that the pollution is spreading inward. Um, mm -hmm. And so anything that you can do with these shoreline adaptations that with time and with, since y'all are doing this adaptive management and seeing which ones work the best in certain situations, that protects our freshwater situation, which is incredibly valuable and important in the health and lives of South Carolinians. Yeah, and, and living shorelines won't necessarily, um, you know, cut down on all flooding, right? I mean, they, yeah, might, help, they, they, they might help minimize it. There's other things that are nature-based solutions that might help better for flood management, um, like in Charleston. And that might be restoring a grasslands area or putting in a floodplain where it used to be um, or in another place that it can start to um, allow for those additional, that, that, that additional water to go to a place that's more natural as opposed to coming up through our sewer systems. Um, these are in kind of blocks. Like when you look at like the living shoreline, it's not you're not going to see a seawall. It's going to be kind of like these blocks that are going to help um, cut up the water flow. Yes. So it's not uh -huh. all coming in at once. It kind of starts okay. to just break it up a little bit. Um, the other benefit is, again, it's going to grow that grassland behind it. And so that grassland is going to be able to absorb some of that water and some of that uh, velocity, um, some of that uh, just current that's coming in. And I think there's even carbon sequestration that goes with that as well. Is there not... There is. I mean, there is carbon sequestration. We're exploring that. Um, our Virginia chapter is really looking at blue carbon storage with oyster and living shorelines. Um, oysters also, one little oyster cleans 50 gallons of water a day. It's amazing. <laughs> it filters that much water. They're amazing little species that have so many um, wonderful kind of benefits, including 
the joy of eating them at a South yeah. Oyster Roast, as we talked about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think that um, y'all are, are exp moving inward. Um, you've, you've got a project planned for Andrews, South Carolina. When we when we when I drive to the beach, I I, I pass through Andrews, um, and they're even seeing the influence of some of these things we're talking about that far in. So talk about how you're even coming farther in than you might expect with some of your projects. Yeah, well, we started, um, gosh, I think it's been six years now, um, working in the North Coast. And we started partnering with the counties and the cities in Horry and in Georgetown counties to identify flood prone areas that they were experiencing. And it just happened to be like right before that, that was back to back years of storms. And yes. it, it allowed us, I think, in those subsequent years when we were looking at this, um, to really see the impacts of these flooding events and these natural um, storms that were coming through and to really kind of identify them. Andrews was identified as it was receiving every nine months, the town was being flooded and people were oh. having to flee their homes. Oh. Um, they were having their homes, their cars, everything was just being flooded. And the first phase that we did was to really look at the stormwater system and to understand better, like, where is the flow? How is the stormwater kind of going? Where is it going? How it, where is it getting held up? And there were a couple of things that were identified. Um, one was that in stormwater drains, like in a town like Andrews, you've got people kind of putting trash into just kind of that, that uh -huh. area. Uh -huh. And so one part of it is public education about making sure that, that you're not obstructing the stormwater in any way with kind of your own stuff, making sure that that part is clean. Um, and then um, the second thing that, that we did is we identified a couple of areas. And so we are working right now. Um, we're trying to find the right funding and the right partners, but we are looking and have, and have designated an area to create a rain garden um, in the city of Andrews that will help store that extra stormwater when it comes in. It will be a natural climate solution that the water will go to this area. In addition to that, there's a community aspect where we are um, going to be producing rain barrels, decorating them and distributing them to the community so that community members can collect their own stormwater. Clemson Extension, um um, Katie Altman, who is um, in our office, has often has rain barrel decorating contests, and we just love to see the ideas that people come up with. So I hope that y'all will have maybe a contest for um, great decorations on rain barrels. Um, adults and children get excited about that. And another thing, when you talked about um, keeping the storm drains open, mm -hmm. is that we have learned that um, the, one of the worst things in the world is a, is a one of those awful um, things that blows all the trash off the yard into the street because that just clogs up those drains. And so we now encourage people to, um, rather than collect their grass clippings and put them on the curb, to let them go back on the soil, which um, improves the soil, it improves the organic matter of the soil. And when you do that, then the soil can actually hold more water after a rain event. So all those things just work in tandem to try to keep water on the land where when it goes through soil, it's cleaned by the natural um, bacteria and and other organisms that are in rather than just dumping it into a storm drain. So there are lots of ways that um, I think we're all finding that, as you say, um, we're interconnected, you know, we're, we are all interconnected and all of our activities seem to um, have an effect downstream. Is What is it they say? Everyone does live downstream. And so <laughs> whatever happens in the upstate is going to affect what happens um, down the downstream. Lowndes, if people would like to know more about the work of the Nature Conservancy and how they might even participate, um, what's the best way to get that information? They can visit our website at nature.org slash sc, and you can get information about uh, South Carolina there, or from there, you can get information on any other state chapter. We're in all 50 states and in over 72 countries around the world, so you can see our local to global priorities. We um, know that wildfires are another threat that we face. And the West, of course, has seen more of them than we have. We've had some here. And prescribed burns are so important for restoring the health of forest and, and creating pollinator habitat and all of that. And I believe y'all have um, 
begun a great deal of work in that area, so I'm going to ask you to come back and talk to me about what you're doing there. And once again, I think that even has an international component. Um, I really th hope people will enjoy learning about the Nature Conservancy. There are other land trusts in South Carolina. All of them are valuable. There may be one in your community that you know you feel more involved in, but um, all of them deserve your consideration and support. And, um, and we thank you for the wonderful work you are doing for the Nature Conservancy. Well, thank you so much. It really takes a village for conservation, and we we love working with all of our land trust partners, all of our state partners, and all of our donors, members, and on behalf of the citizens of South Carolina. So thank you for having us today.